Snapshots today are going are to take us up to a question of when are you most free? When are you most free? Now, I, I got a biblical principle that I want to start off with. It's this. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Would you say that with me? Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Try it one more time. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So, we've been looking at Exodus, and we saw, saw from the very beginning of our snapshots that it was a nation that was enslaved in bondage. And God came with a rescuer by the name of Moses, and Moses was leading the people out. <clears throat> Pharaoh didn't want to let them go. Ten times he said, let my people go. Finally, he let them go at the cost of his own son. He leads them as uh, 12 nomadic tribes. You know, Moses, all he had been before this was a shepherd. And now he's leading 12 nomadic tribes into the wilderness. Things aren't going so well. They're without food. They're without water. The people are complaining. They're bickering. They're fighting. And he's trying to lead this motley crew. And, and, and he's taking them to a place called Mount Sinai, Mount, Mount Horeb. Because there God's going to meet with them. There they're supposed to worship. And the 12 tribes... Uh, Moses is trying to do the whole thing. He's trying to, he's trying to be the judge, the leader, and everything. And, and, and you remember last time we saw that his father-in-law Jethro said, Moses, you're going to kill yourself. You can't do it all. You're bringing too much stress to your life. You've got to give some of this up. And so he organizes the people. Groups of tens, hundreds, thousands, and then Moses is at the top. And they're organized and they moved from 12 nomadic tribes in the pivotal chapters of 19 and 20, something is done that makes them into one nation under God. I've heard that expression before, haven't you? One nation under God, kind of in our Pledge of Allegiance. They literally become one nation under God. Now the pivotal point is they're actually brought to Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. And if you read uh, chapter 19 of Exodus, you will find, and we're just, I'm just going to summarize it, uh, that they arrive there and, and Moses is told, uh, hey, separate the people. Sanctify them. Set them back. Set some boundaries around the mountain because I'm coming down on the mountain. For three days, they're to sanctify themselves and make sure they're a holy people because I'm a holy God and I'm coming down on the mountain. When he comes down on the mountain, oh my goodness, you read this passage and you shake in your boots, you quake because you realize they were before holy God. In Hebrews it says, our God is a consuming fire. Sometimes we don't appreciate the holiness of God as we ought. He comes down on the mountain and it says there's smoke all around the mountain. There's lightning. There's flashes of this lightning. There's peals of thunder. There's smoke. There's a burning furnace. It says, it's just like a kiln, just burning and smoke coming out of it. And God comes down on the mountain. Later we find out it is such a terrifying event because the whole mountain and the ground is shaking when this all happens. God is coming down. He wants them to know that you're not in just anybody's presence. You're in the presence of God Almighty. The people later in chapter 20 are so afraid. They say, Moses, we don't want to go up to God. We want you to go up. This is the beginning of a representative form of government. Moses, you go to God because we're afraid of him. He's too holy for us. All right? God then calls Moses up and says, talks to Moses and then says, Moses, you've got to go back down. The people are getting too close to the mountain. Isn't that the way we are? You draw a line, say don't go up to that line. You go as far as you can and see if you can get without falling over that's exactly what they, Moses go back down tell people back off they're getting too close it's not going to be good for them if they do while he goes back down then the Bible says that God speaks out of this cloud to all the people you find that at the beginning of chapter 20 and God speaks the Ten Commandments they're not written down at this point they are spoken out of the cloud God is speaking to Moses and all the people. 
Later in Exodus 24, Moses will go up on the mountain, and with the finger of God, they'll be written, and Moses is going to write down everything else in chapters 21, 23, 24. He's going to write down all the other commands that the Lord made, because altogether there are 613 commands in the Old Testament. Torah. But he gives the ten to all the people. This ten commandments becomes the law for the nation under God. One nation under God, liberty in law. Where do you think we got all these concepts anyways in America? We get them right from this passage. We get them from God's law. So he gives the law to the people. So I want to talk about the law this morning. I want to focus more on Exodus chapter 20 and the law, but before I do that, I just want to talk about law in general. I want to talk about the law of the tracks, okay? Uh, you see the two railroad tracks? It's kind of like the two tablets, all right? The ones on one rail was the first four. Of course, they were written on front side and back on two tablets. I think the first four commandments were on the one tablet, and the last six were on the other tablet, and it's kind of like the two railroad tracks. I've got a question for you. Is the train most free? On the tracks or off the tracks? Oh, come on. That's a no-brainer. Everybody get the answer here? It's most free on the tracks. Okay. All right, you get the picture. All right, I got it. Here's the law of the road. The law of the road goes like this. When is the car most free? On the road or in the ditch? On the road. On the road. Okay. Oh, this is a good class. I like this class. Right. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, one more time. The law of the sea. The law of the sea. Is the, the ship most free in the sea? Or is the ship most free when it's running around? <laughs> all right, why am I doing all this? Why am I doing all this? Here's my point. When are you most free? And the answer to that question is when you obey the law of your creator. When you obey the laws of, for which you were created. That's when you are most free. You fulfill the purpose for which you were made. The train is most free when it's fulfilling. It's on the tracks. You know what we say when a person's not on the track? We say, they're a train wreck. Their life's a train wreck. What are we saying? They're not following the rules of life. Okay? Uh, we'll say, that person's life, they made a left turn somewhere. They're in the ditch. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? They... they we are most free when we obey the law of our Creator. Now, what is the law? What law am I supposed to follow? Ha <laughs> here it is. It's the law. Now think about it for a moment. God is the king. He's the king of the universe. He's the absolute highest. He's called the sovereign, the most high. He is king. He is God. He's over everything. If you're a king, anything you will is law for whoever you will it to. That's the way it is. These commandments that he gives is the will of God, and they're not ten suggestions. These are ten commandments. God is not just recommending. He's telling you, this is my will. It's the will of God. So let's look at them. I'm going to throw them in a positive light because most people say, oh, it's so negative. Well, no, I think these are really positive. The first one has to do with the sanctity of God. The sanctity of God. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 2, it says, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. The sanctity of God is this. By sanctity, the word sanctity means to set apart, set apart from everything else. God is set apart from everything else. He is God. There's no one else. That's what the Bible says. Isaiah 45, 22. I am God. There is no other one. I'm it. So I'm set apart from everything else. Everything else is created. I am God. He says, and you shall have no other lowercase gods before me. I want first place in your life. Now remember... This is the constitution for the nation. God is saying to the nation Israel, I want first place in your nation. 
Now, we are not in a theocracy as they were in a theocracy. That is, God's ruling over uh, us like directly like they did in Israel. We are in a democracy, which means we're, we're led by the many, the people. And, and we, like they, have a representative government. We, the people, elect our representatives to lead us just like they said, Moses, you go to God because we're too afraid. We elect our people and they go, they represent us. The principles are here the same. I am the Lord, you shall have no other gods before me. We need to be a people who has God first and choose representatives who have God first. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? The sanctity of God. He is to be the priority, number one. The second commandment here is uh, the sanctity of worship. It's worship. You shall not make for yourself idols. And he talks a little bit more about idols. And he says, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. No, just talking about making a man-made thing. And of course, I got like a little Oscar there. Because uh, a lot of things come in place of God. We put before God. One of the most recent ones is sports. Sports has come before God. It's true. The younger generation, a lot of them aren't in church because they've got a sports activity they're taking the kids to on Sunday. That was unheard of when I was a kid. There were no sports on Sunday. In fact, they didn't even plan practices on Wednesdays because they knew that all the churches had a Wednesday night service. Remember the day? Some of you do, some of you don't. You shall not worship them. You're not to make have anything else take my place of being number one. Not even your family, not your spouse. God is to be number one. He says, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. God is jealous. You know, most of us think jealousy, uh, jealousy is a bad emotion. No, jealousy is a good emotion if it's used correctly. All our emotions are good. Every emotion I have is good. Do you know the Bible tells me to be angry? Anger is a good emotion. It says be angry and sin not. Oh, I've got to use my anger in such a way I don't sin. I've got to use my jealousy in a certain way that I don't sin. The Bible tells us it's good for a husband to be jealous for his wife. I don't want anybody else messing with my wife. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. This is the kind of jealousy. It's a holy thing. It's a protective thing. It's just an ownership thing. She's my wife. Go get your own. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? God is saying, I'm your God. Tell the other ones, I got my God. Go get your own. I got my God. You don't go chasing these other gods. He says, listen, as he goes on, he's punishing the children for the iniquity of the parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me. This has been so misunderstood. So many have misunderstood this. Because it says in Ezekiel chapter 18, it says that God does not punish the child for a parent's sin. The parent is judged for his own sin and the child is judged for its own sin. What it's saying here is, I influence my children. And my breaking the commandments is observed by my children. They do as I do, not as I say. To the second, the third, and the fourth generation. So if I put sports more important than God for my kids on Sunday, they're going to teach their children the same. We're going to teach their children the same. He says, down to the fourth generation. But he says, listen to this. But I'm showing steadfast love to thousands of generations of those who love me and my commandments. What he's saying is, because you love me doesn't mean that your children are going to love me, but he says, because you love me, they'll see it in you and then it'll be passed on. It'll be passed on and be passed on. And he's saying, you go down a thousand generations and if they love me, I will love them. If they keep my commandments, I will love them. What was true back in Moses' day is true today. If we love the Lord with all of our heart, he will love us too. He'll bless us. He will. The sanctity of worship. The next one is the sanctity of God's name. God's name is to be set apart from every other name. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord. For the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. The Jews took this so seriously 
that you see the four letters there, all capitalized L-O-R-D. That is the, the Hebrew letters Yod, Hey, Bob, Hey. And, and if we were to pronounce it according to Hebrews, it would be Yahweh. But that was, they didn't want to say that. Maybe I said that in vain. Maybe I, I didn't say that correctly. So they substituted the vowels for the word Adonai, which means master in its place. And so when you pronounce the word, the letters, the Y-H-W-H, -H, with the, letter, the vowels from Adonai, it comes out Jehovah. It comes out Jehovah. That's how we get the name Jehovah. They were so careful that they did not want to take the name of the Lord in vain that they substituted Adonai every time. They wouldn't read Yahweh, they read Adonai, Adonai. They would call him Master rather than call him Lord because what if I didn't say that correctly? But I don't think that's what the text is about at all. I think the text is about this. In the Hebrew concept, the name represents who you are and what you do. Who you are and what you do. I am that I am, he revealed himself to Moses. I am the self-existent God. He says, do not wrongfully use that I am the self-existent God. And what does the self-existent God do? He tells us in Exodus chapter 6. I redeem my people. I'm a God of salvation. I think we use the name of God in vain or misuse it here whenever I blame God for something I messed up on <laughs> You know, I've really screwed up and said, God, what's the problem? Why aren't you there for me? I'm accusing God, who's always there for me, of my mistake. I'm misusing the name of God. Misusing the name of God. It's interesting in the political realm today, in the election of 2012, there was a big problem at the Democratic National Convention. Somehow on the party platform, they had eliminated God any mention of God in their platform statement, their declaration of what they believe. So because of that, you know, and I'm a Bible guy, they decided I'd check out the 2016, see what they did. So I downloaded the whole platform, 55 pages of it. Rather than read all 55 pages, you can do that, but I, I didn't. I put it in a program I could search. And the name God appeared one time. You know what? They can't be accused of taking the name of God out of their platform. <laughs> but it's in a reference, God given. So I said, oh, what's good for the goose, good for the gander. I'm going to check out the Republicans, too. I downloaded theirs. I think it's like 65. One's 55, 165 pages long. Did the same thing. Did the search on it. Sixteen times the word God comes up. Well, one time it's in the word Godzilla. I had to look that one up. I went, what? <laughs> and the whole thing was, it's a Godzilla tax. That's what they're calling Obamacare, a Godzilla. What do I mean? They mean that thing is just blown so out of proportion. It's a monster. It's out of control tax. All right. But all the others, I checked them out. About half and half. Half say God-given. That's our God-given duty, things like that. Okay. The other half makes some declaration about God is being the one that we are ultimately accountable to. I thought that was all very interesting. You're going to sanctify the name of God. Put him in his right place. Put him in your right place. The next one is the sanctity of rest and work. Rest and work. There's a twofold obligation here. Most people only focus on one. He says, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Set apart one day of the week, the Sabbath, the rest day. The Sabbath means rest, a day of rest. We are to remember every week to have a day of rest. We need time out. God has designed us for time out. Time out for worship. We'll find that as we go down through this passage. The second part of this, though, is six days shalt thou labor. You will labor six days and you'll do all your works. This is not if you like to. This is, this is what you are to do. This is a command. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2 when he created man. He created man. Here's his purpose. The purpose of man is to till the ground. God made us to work. But he says you'll wear out if you don't take a day off. You take one day off every week. You take a day of rest. You are to work. The Protestant work ethic is what has made America great. We believe that work 
is holy. Work is good. God says work is good. We've got a generation that's coming up that thinks that play is good and work is evil. They work harder at play and they play at work. That is not the Protestant work ethic. I love what I do. Does it show? I love what I do. I, I, I love, I, I, they asked me, the search committee asked me, uh, how long do you plan to be a pastor? I said, I hope to die in the pulpit. <laughs> I love what I do. You see, six days shall you labor. There was a welfare system built into the Old Testament. It really wasn't welfare. It was called workfare. That's what I would call it, workfare. The New Testament builds on this whole idea of six days shall you labor. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, it says, If a man will not work, neither should he eat. That's pretty powerful. It doesn't say if a man cannot work. But if he is able and he will not, don't feed the man. He gets hungry enough, he'll go to work. He'll figure out a way to make some money and get some food. It's called a workfare. In fact, in the Old Testament, if you go to Le Leviticus 19, I believe it's in Leviticus 23, two times it tells that when you are harvesting, there was a system there for the poor, the indigent, the, the people that just didn't have anything. It said when you are gleaning, when you're going through your fields and you're harvesting, you never make a second pass. You go through and you forgot, you leave that. Whatever you, you don't get, you leave it there. You never, you never harvest the corners of your field. You always leave corners standing, whatever your crop is. That is for the poor. You give it to them, but they have to work for it. They have to go through the fields and pick it up themselves. They got to take it home. If it's weak, they got to go home and they got to grind it. They got to make something out of it. They go to the corners and they, they harvest it themselves. You, you, he says, it's a workfare program, not a welfare program. Now, the reason why you have a job, if you have a job, the Bible says, let him who stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands so that he may have something to give to those who are in need. Welfare system was your community. It wasn't the government. The community took care of community. Brother took care of brother. Family took care of family. If you had no family, your community was your family. You took care of each other. You, you prospered, you gave to someone else. Why? Because you knew someday fortunes might turn and they may need to give to you. And so I, I, I am to be charitable in my giving. There's so much more we could do with this, this, this whole thing. But on the seventh day is the day of rest. He said, now, don't be a workaholic. It's easy to fall into that trap, too. You don't work every day. You take time out. The Sabbath is to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work on it. This is what you're supposed to do. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them. And he rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Now, after six days of labor, the Lord was not tired and all pooped out. And, oh, man, that was a big feat. No, God is omnipotent. He had as much strength and power when he was done creating as he did before. So what does it mean he rests? It means he sat in contemplation of all that he had done, and he said it is good. No, he said it is very good. So when I work all week because I'm working for God, it doesn't matter what I do. If I'm a policeman, I'm a school teacher, I'm a lawyer, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm doing that for God at the end of the week. I sit and I relax in worshiping God and saying, God, thank you for letting me do everything I did all week. Isn't that wonderful? You say, well, why don't we do the Sabbath? Why aren't we worshiping on Saturday? Well, because in the New Testament, something greater took place than creation. It's called resurrection. Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week. And so we no longer just look backwards to creation that I'm a created being of God, but we look at resurrection. And one day, even though this mortal body will die, I will be resurrected and I celebrate a greater thing than creation, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I do that every, on the first day of every week, on Sunday. Next thing he says here, hey, listen, I want you as a nation to sanctify the family, the sanctity of the family. 
Honor your father and your mother. There's a few people here who know who these two people are. That's my and my brother Jerry's mom and dad. A little bit in their older years. Um, some commentators believe this was really written to the adults and not to the children. You will always be the child of a parent, even if they have passed on. I'll tell you right now, with the exception of Jesus and maybe Moses, these are the two greatest people ever lived. Two greatest people ever lived. You know what that is? That's honoring my mom and dad. It's honoring them. I can tell you great stories about my parents, and other people corroborate them too, because they were really great people. But even if I don't have wonderful parents, he says, honor your father and your mother. This is not an option. You dig up something. If you can't figure out anything else, you just say, they gave me birth. You, you, you honor them. This is the only commandment listed here with it gives a promise so that your days may be long in the land. Now, they don't have a land now. They're going to the land. He's saying, if you'll honor them, you'll live long when you get into the promised land. You'll, you'll have a long life. But the Lord is giving it. The next one is the sanctity of life. Sanctity of life. Life is so sacred. God says, you shall not murder. Now, I believe with all my heart that he is including in this the preborn. Preborn. And I can make a, a, a case from the scriptures about this. You just go to the next chapter. He says, two men are, are, are fighting with each other. And one, somehow, in his fight, hits a pregnant woman. Well, why does he say pregnant woman, not just woman? Because he wants to talk about the baby. He says that he strikes a pregnant woman and uh, it causes her to give birth. If the baby is okay, then all you can do is give a penalty and a fine. The high priest will determine the fine. But if there is any damage, to whom? Well, he's talking, if he just met the woman, he never mentioned the pregnant woman, but he met the baby. If there's any damage, then he gives the lex talionis, which is simply this. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for life. I know it's really hard for some, but the Bible teaches that life begins at conception. The baby in the womb is a living human being. Science tells us the exact same thing. Some people say, well, what about pro-choice? Doesn't a mother have the choice over her own body? Yeah, she does, but the baby's not her body. Science teaches us this. You do a DNA sampling of the mother and you get one DNA code. You do a DNA sampling of the child, you take it to, the, to an expert on it, and they'll say, uh, are these two the same? They'll say, no, they're related, but no, this, this is, is it human? Yeah, it's human. Oh, and it's not the same? No, no, these are not the same person. That is not your body. It's not your choice to take someone else's life. The Bible talks about, and I go on other passages, but it's not, you shall not murder the preborn, you shall not murder the disabled. Listen, we got a problem going on right now. There's a Zika virus. These poor children are born. You know what they want to do? People want to get, they want to get a test to find out what the condition of the baby is so they can choose whether or not to abort it. All life is sacred. I, I recall when, when Moses said, that, I can't even speak, and God said, hey, who made the blind? God said, I did. Well, you mean the blind don't have a right to life? Yes, they do. All life is special to God. Listen, there are those like Dr. Kuvorkian who think that, hey, I can play God, and I can tell you when it's time to end the life. That is not your call. All life matters to God. The pre-born life it, it doesn't matter what life, it's the elderly's life, the handicapped life, uh, black lives, white lives, Asian lives. Listen, every single life, my enemy's life matters to God. It's true. All life matters. All life matters. I go a little bit further in the passage, it says, uh, and then there's the sanctity of marriage. You shall not commit adultery. Adultery is having sexual relations outside the bond of marriage, and I don't care what kind it is. Sexual marriage outside, uh, a sexual relationship outside of being married to a person of the opposite sex, that's biblical, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. God created them Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. 
Adam and Eve, God performed the wedding, and God told them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. That's part of marriage, as you're supposed to reproduce. Can't do that if you're not of the opposite sex. This is biblical marriage. Anything outside of that, if it's with the same kind of person, a different kind of person. If, if, if you're a single and you're not married, it's called fornication in the Bible. If you're married and you're having sexual relationship with somebody outside your, your marriage, it's called adultery. Uh, if you do it with an animal, it's called bestiality. If you do it, the Bible says anything out of that husband and wife relationship is wrong. We believe in the sake that God is saying, for a structured, ordered society, these are the rails you run on. You want to have purpose, meaning in your life. You follow my commands with the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of property, the sanctity of property. You shall not steal. That implies somebody owns something and you took it from them. If you go to the 21st chapter, there's a whole section on civil laws and it has to do with your property. You have property rights. The Bible nowhere teaches socialism and communism. Not at all. Nowhere. It teaches that you have the right to own property. Property. Sanctity of property. The sanctity of truth. Boy, this is one that we've uh, lost today. We call it disinformation. It means you're just not lying. You're, you're lying, but you, people don't want to say, oh, he's lying. Oh, they spread disinformation. It's not, it's not true. It's so bad that we have a political, a presidential candidate that lies about the lies. And you know that. Our system, our whole country is so messed up. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You are to tell the truth. The government is to tell the truth. And truth to our people. The next one is the sanctity of com contentment. We are to be content. You shall not covet. It's got your neighbor's house, your, your, your neighbor's wife, your, your neighbor's uh, servants. Uh, your neighbor's donkey, uh, your neighbor's ox. Okay, you're not supposed to. They're Cadillac, you know, and, and uh, they're, you're not supposed. And, and they're, they're SUV. You're not supposed to be. None of that stuff. He says you're, you're supposed to be content. Paul said, you know, all these I did really well, but this last one, wanting things that other people had, that was a tough one. That's a killer. The others are just do or don't. This one has to do with my heart. What's going on inside, inside me? We come to the end of these, and I want to say this. Jesus summed them all up in just two. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You love God. That covers the first four commandments. You love the Lord with all... If you love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, if you love Him that way, you'll automatically do those first four. It'll just come naturally to you. This is the greatest and first commandment. Then he says, and the second is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You'll love your neighbor. If, if I love my neighbor as myself, and I don't want my neighbor coveting my wife, then I won't covet his wife. You see what I'm saying? If I don't want him stealing my goods, I won't steal his goods. So if Jesus says, if you really love with a biblical love, these come naturally to you. You'll just do these. So you don't do them because they're obligations. You've got to do them. You love God. And the more you love God, the more you do these. The more you do these. So the question is, when are you most free? I've kind of answered that. It's when you glorify God by loving the Lord with all your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself. So I got two takeaways today. Getting down to the end of my message. Two takeaways. The first one is, you are most free when you sanctify God. Worship God's name. Rest work, when you sanctify the family, when you sanctify life and marriage, prophecy, a property, and truth, and contentment, that's when you are most free, because that's when you fulfill the purpose for which you were created, and you are really free. You're the train on the tracks. You're going somewhere. When you get off of these, your, your life is a train wreck. It's a train wreck. Now, second takeaway is our nation is most free when it too sanctifies God, worship God's name, and all of these things. And I got them listed there with the Ten Commandments. So I have one real takeaway for you today. I made up a voter's guide for you. It's the Ten Commandment Voter's Guide. Choose the candidate 
who is most biblically correct, B.C., not P.C. Here they are. Who defends freedom of religion, who maintains the faith correctly, who defends freedom of worship, who is pro-work, who is pro-biblical family, who is pro-life, who is pro-biblical marriage, who is private ownership, who, who tells the truth, who is not greedy for money and power. And I got one for everybody today on your way out. You can get... Now, you know what you do? When you go to the voting booth, take God with you. Just go into the voting booth and you, you, know, you lay this thing right down and say, God, I'm not going to vote for any party. I'm not going to vote for any union's recommendation. I'm not going to vote because the pastor said anything. God, I'm going to vote my conscience according to your law for the candidate you would have. You know what the bottom line is? We will all give an account even for the way we vote. Even for the way we vote, we will give an account. I want to vote Christian. I want to vote the will of God. I will scrutinize my candidates and only pick the ones that are the closest. Out of all those running right now, there's one guy I really like. His name is Pence. Pence says this, I am a Christian first. I like that in a candidate. Hope you do too. I'm a Christian first. Christian first. People ask me, how do you vote? I'll tell you how I vote. I vote Christian. I vote Christian. Are they all Christ-like? Nah. Am I? I try to be. Am I always? No. But I try to vote for the one that is most according to B.C., biblically correct, most Christ-like. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so very thankful that you've given us a guideline for a meaningful, purposeful life, individually and collectively as a nation. When our nation has been on the tracks of following your law, and, and the, Lord, we know that's the way it was founded, fleeing Europe to become in a new land where we had freedom of worship, being built upon the principles of these commandments. Lord, we have veered, we've strayed, and our nation's a real mess. Help us, Lord, as citizens in this nation to cast our vote in a meaningful way so that righteousness might be restored. For righteousness exalts a nation. But violation of your law is a disgrace and a reproach to our entire people. Give us wisdom to vote correctly in the upcoming elections. I pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.